Well, to, today we finish up the book, but not necessarily the class, and just so you all uh, get your money's worth, uh, Dewey added one additional class, it will be on the 7th of March, usually by the end of February we flip over, but he said no, and I asked him if the pay would be commensurate, he said no. <laughs> so, so you're Pay them. Yeah, I have to pay them. Like, that's what we have to do anyway. But yeah, you know, uh, he promised me a fifty percent increase, and he gave it to me. I mean, fifty percent is zero. <laughs> this still zero. All right, let's get started. Today we are going to be looking at um, the ten spies. And we all know that story, the ten spies, and how they were faithless, and how they're faithless, just like with Demetrius last week led to a almost a revolt there uh, at, when they were looking to go across into the uh, uh, promised land they looked to see uh, they got into this uh, discussion and we'll get to it but what we'd like to do first is go back to the promise that god made to abraham to isaac and to jacob and we start in uh, chapter 12 of Genesis, chapter 12 of Genesis, and that's uh, starting at verse 1. The Lord said to Abram, as he was known at the time, Go from your country, your people, and your father's household to the land I will show you. Now, Abram at the time was in a land called Haran, H A R R A N, but God sent him to the land of Canaan. I will make, in, uh, make you into a great nation. And I will bless you. I will make your name great, and your you and you will be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you, and whoever curses you, I will curse. And all the peoples on the earth will be blessed through you. So Abram went as the Lord had directed him or told him, and Lot went with him. Abram was 75 years old when he set out from Haran. He and his wife Sarah and his nephew Lot, all the possessions they had accumulated and the people they had acquired in Haran, and all the, and the people they had acquired, and they set out for the land of Canaan and they arrived there. Abram traveled through the land as far as the site of the great tree of Moreh at Shechem. At that time, the Canaanites were in the land. The Lord appeared to Abram and said to your offspring, to your seed, to your generations, I will give this land, give this land. That's very important when we get to today's lesson. It was not you have to fight for it. I will give it to you. So he built an altar there to the Lord who had appeared to him. Now we move down to the next generation. And notice he didn't say which generation it will be. He did not say, you will lead them in. All right? Because as we know, uh, with the Israelites, they have their timetable and God has his timetable. The two rarely, rarely match. Next we see, oh, I'm sorry, let me finish up. Uh, well, let's go to Genesis 15, 13. I'm sorry. We're still in Genesis. We're still at the beginning. The beginning of the class. The beginning of the Bible. Yeah. Then the Lord said to him, and the him there would be um, Isaac. No, so I think this is still, he's still talking to uh, uh, Abram there. No, for certain that for 400 years your descendants will be strangers in the country, not their own, and that they will be enslaved and mistreated there. The um, point there is there's going to be a very large contingent of Israelites in Egypt. And that's the, that's the country that he was talking about. <coughs> and then Abraham's, now Abraham's son Isaac enters uh, this picture in uh, chapter 26 of Genesis. This is just a drill. It's behind all those chapters in Genesis. For those of you who don't know where 26 is, it's right after 25 and before 27. All right. And this is verses 1 through 3. 
Now there was a famine in the land, besides the previous famine in Abraham's time. And Isaac went to Abimelech, king of the Philistines in Gerar. The Lord appeared to Isaac and said, Do not go down to Egypt. Live in the land where I tell you to live. Stay in this land for a while, and I will be with you. That's another promise he makes to them. I will be with you. And then he goes, then God goes on to say here, and bless you, and bless you. For to you and your descendants, I will give the land, these lands and will confirm the oath I swore to your father Abraham. So now he is telling Isaac, I promised this to, to uh, Abraham, your father. What was the promise? I will give you that land. Then we fast forward again to chapter 26 of Genesis, this time verses uh, 10 through 15. And we will look at Jacob, the son of Isaac. Jacob left Beersheba and set out for Haran. When he reached a certain place, he stopped for the night. Because the sun had set. Yeah, that's usually what happens at nighttime. That's why it's dark after that. Uh, taking one of the stones there, he put it under his head and lay down to sleep. That would be a good time for my pillow uh, advertising because using a stone for a pillow must have been really comfortable. He had a dream in which he saw a stairway resting on the earth with its top reaching to heaven, and the angels of God were ascending and descending on it. There above it stood the Lord, and he said, I am the Lord, the God of your father Abraham, and the God of Isaac. I will give you and your descendants the land on which you are lying. Your descendants will be like the dust of the earth, and you will spin uh, out, and you will spread out to the west and to the east to the north and to the south. All peoples on earth will be blessed through you and your offspring. Once again, I will give you this land. I am with you and watch over you wherever you go, and I will bring you back to this land. I will not leave you until I have done what I promised. So now God has made this promise originally and reaffirmed it twice to the generation to the descendant, descendants of Abraham. Now let's move on to uh, Genesis 50. See, so we're going to get through Genesis here soon. Okay. Genesis 50, verses 15 through 21. We now have the setting here is that uh, Joseph is uh, in Egypt. Joseph is one of Jacob's sons. And we all know how interesting it was that the uh, his, his uh, how Jacob ended up in Egypt, and we're going to see this um, in uh, Genesis chapter fifty, uh, at the beginning of verse fifteen, when Joseph's brothers saw that their father was dead, so Jacob has died. They said, what if Joseph holds a grudge against us and pays us back for all the wrongs we did to him? Now, what did he do to them, to him? Well, first, they were extremely jealous of him, weren't they? He was daddy's favorite son, really. He had the coat of many colors. I don't know how, I mean, if you start wearing a coat of many colors here now, that would stand out, but it would really stand out for negative reasons, probably. But gave him a coat of many colors. He was very... Uh, they were very jealous of him. So they plotted to do what? To kill him. Well, that's pretty serious. I realize some may say, well, you know, a lot of the Old Testament involves a lot of mass killings and so forth. But it's still killing your own brother. Well, I guess we could say Cain did it to Abel, so whatever. They had precedent there. They're going to kill their own brother. Instead, they did what? They traded him to uh, some trade, some. Uh, Travelers from Egypt were going to Egypt. And they went into Egypt and took him into Egypt. Now that would seem like a very negative thing, wouldn't it? But what we know happened after that is what? Joseph becomes very important in the Egyptian government. So God's plan, that's God's plan. It works so smoothly. And Joseph then has a dream. 
And the dream basically is seven years of plenty, <coughs> seven years of famine will come to Egypt. I what did he do? Is that? It's Pharaoh's dream. <coughs> oh, the Pharaoh's dream. I'm sorry. He interpreted it for him. And Pharaoh took great, uh, great, uh, thought Joseph was very important. So now we've got, all right, so what does he say? He says, let's, uh, let's plan for this. And Joseph does. And they build up storehouses during the time of plenty. So by the time the, the drought, or the, I say trout, by the time the, the um, famine comes, it is not a, uh, <clears throat> there, is, there is one place to go. And that's where uh, they, Jacob goes, and that's where they meet Joseph and so forth. But what Joseph says to them really is uh, they were concerned with him. Uh, they were concerned about what he's going to do. His brothers then came and threw themselves down before him. We are your slaves, they said. But Joseph said to them, don't be afraid. Am I in the place of God? You intended to harm me, but God intended it for good to accomplish what is now being done. Those plans uh, were God had the plan, thing planned out. <clears throat> the saving of many lives. Because Egypt had done what Joseph directed there, they had really enough to, to uh, feed a number of people. So then, don't be afraid. I will provide for you and your children. And he reassured them and spoke kindly to them. Now, Let's move on. We finished Genesis, right? So let's go to Exodus. No, that doesn't mean leave. That means stay. We'll go to Exodus, right? It does not mean exit us. All right. We'll go to Exodus 1, 6 through 14. Now, what has happened here is the Israelites have been in slavery now in Egypt uh, for about 400 years. So we're really fast forwarding, and yes, we will get to the promised land, or near it, later this morning. <clears throat> now Joseph and all his brothers and all the, that generation had died. But the Israelites were exceedingly fruitful. They multiplied greatly, increased in numbers, and became so numerous that the land was filled with them. Then a new king, to whom Joseph meant nothing, in other words, this new Pharaoh did not know what Joseph had done. Joseph is dead. New Pharaoh comes in. He came to power in Egypt. And he says in verse 9 there, Look, he said to his people, the Israelites have, come, have become far too numerous for us. This is a danger. He's got living in his country these fruitful and multiplying Israelites. The uh, come, come, we must deal shrewdly with them or they will become even more numerous. And if war breaks out, we'll join our enemies, fight against us, and leave the country. Now, he fears a revolution from within. So, what do we do? Well, he says, so, we, so they put slave masters over them to oppress them with forced labor. And they built Python. And Ramses has store cities for Pharaoh. Mm -hmm. In other words, they're storing up things for him. He can kind of go to the bunker, if you will, if, that, if the war breaks out. So they got him covered. But the more they were oppressed, the more they multiplied and spread. So the Egyptians came to dread the Israelites and worked them ruthlessly. ruthlessly. They made their lives bitter and harsh labor in brick and mortar with all kinds of work in the fields. Mm -hmm. In all their harsh labor, the Egyptians worked them Ruthlessly. So what was the first population control policy of the new Pharaoh? Work them to death. Work them to death. It didn't work. So we had to come up with a second one. And that was, of course, to kill the uh, males, all of the males. Give them as a sacrifice to the god, the River Nile. And that's where they were to be drowned. Now, we also know that God watches out for his people. So in Exodus 3, Exodus 3, 7 through 9, God heard his people because they were crying out. This was oppressive. 
the God, the Lord said, I have indeed seen the misery of misery, misery, misery of my people in Egypt. I've heard them crying out because of their slave drivers, and I'm concerned about their suffering. So I've come down to rescue them from the hand of the Egyptians and to bring them up to out of that land and into a good and spacious land, <clears throat> a land flowing with milk and honey. The home of the Canaanites, Hittites, Amorites, Perizzites, Hivites, and Jebusites, and any other ites. And now the cry of Israel has reached me, and I have seen the way the Egyptians are oppressing him. Now God knew about this oppression. He knew about what was happening. But now, now the stage is set for that promise to be fulfilled. <laughs> These are obviously, they've been there for 400 years, so these are many generations removed from Abraham. But at the same time, they are his descendants, because he was made a nation, if you will, as God, as we read earlier. So now, they are uh, ready <coughs> to leave Egypt. And all of this worked into the plan, so that at this point, uh, it would be time for them to leave Egypt and they would be let out. We know who did that. It is Moses and in Exodus 23. See, we're zipping through Exodus. This is a fast Exodus, a lot faster than it went. 23, 20 through 23, uh, God tells Moses, See, I am sending an angel ahead of you to guard you along the way and to bring you to the place I have prepared. They didn't have to find it. They did not have to Google it, go to Google Maps to find where they're going. He, they knew he had provided a uh, someone to lead them there, that was Moses. And, the, and Moses would be led by an angel. Pay attention to him. This is something all of the Israelites could have, have uh, taken there, pay attention. And listen to what he says. Do not rebel against him. He will not forgive your rebellion since my name, and notice that name in the New International there is capitalized. So this is not just, you know, my name is. This is God, it is in him. If you listen carefully, very important again, what he says, and do all that I say, I will be an enemy to your enemies, and I will oppose those who oppose you. My angel will go ahead of you and bring you into the land of, here we go again, Amorites, Hittites, Perizzites, Canaanites, Hivites, and Jebusites. And I will wipe them out. Very important things that he has said leading up to all this. I will give you this land. I will be with you in this land. And I will wipe out all of those who occupy the land. And yet that still doesn't work, does it? It did not work. All right, well, let's see what happened here now. Now we're zipping along. We get to Exodus 33 now. See, we didn't know we were going to go this fast. You thought it's going to be really slow, right? What has been? We'll get there. <clears throat> then the Lord said to Moses, leave this place, you and the people you brought out, out of Egypt, and go to the land I promised on oath to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob saying, I will give it to your descendants. I will send an angel before you and drive out the Canaanites and so forth, all of those groups, and go up to the land flowing with milk and honey. But I will not go with you because you are stiff-necked, because you are a stiff-necked people, and I might destroy you on the way. What did they do? What did the Israelites do? They get free from Egyptian oppression, they get to the Red Sea, and what's the first thing they say? Well, it's bringing us out here. We want to go back to Egypt. Then he opens up the Red Sea. They cross over. The army is right behind them, and they all, the army dies in the in this Red Sea. So as soon as they get on the other side, what do they say? Why did he bring us out here to kill us? Why did he bring us out here to make us die? Huh? Wine, wine, wine. All right? They took the land of milk and honey and turned it into the land of wine. And that's not wine. <laughs> it's wine. Okay? 
But then what happens? Moses goes up on, on Mount Sinai. And what do they do? Where'd that guy, that guy Moses go? Well, I'll tell you what we'll do. And as, remember, um, couple of it's been about a year and a half now ago that we studied the story the entire bible but we got to the part where Aaron basically said well I was just standing there and threw this in and out came a golden cow you know it's like Aaron you got to come up with a better story than that there's nobody who's going to believe that well what they made a golden cow and here we are and then Miriam and Aaron, and I think it was Aaron wasn't it got together and they wanted to overthrow it Moses along the way. This and why? And they kept saying, We want to go back to Egypt. We want to go back to Egypt where we had it so good. Because now we have to eat manna <coughs> and we have to eat quail. Okay. There was no pleasing. And that's why he's talking about a stiff necked people. Stiff, uh, among other things. But anyway, now let's go to Deuteronomy. We will get to Revelation probably about quarter after nine. No, we won't do that. Now, this Deuteronomy, of course, we have um, here in Deuteronomy 1, 19 through 25. Um, they, and this is this is a... Uh, uh, Moses was the author of this. And it is sort of a retelling of what happened. Then, as the Lord our God commanded us, we set out from Horeb and went toward the hill country of the Amorites through all that vast and dreadful wilderness that you have seen. And so we uh, reached Kadesh Bar Bar uh, Barnea. Then I said to you, you have reached the hill country of the Amorites, which the Lord God is giving us. Once again, if they use the word give, give, or giving or give, so many times, see the Lord your God has um, given uh, given you the land. Go up and take possession of it, as the Lord the God, the God of your ancestors, told you. Don't be afraid. Do not be discouraged. And what did you, what what do you have said positively? What's that word it begins with F? Have faith. Well, they didn't, that part they didn't get, did they? Didn't get. You're not supposed to say get. Didn't get. Okay. So here we are. And then we go to Deuteronomy um, uh, 119 as we're uh, there. What they then say, uh, that then all of you came to me. This is Moses again. All of you to the Israelites came to me at verse 22 and said, let us send Man ahead to spy out the land for us and bring back a report about the route we are to take and the towns we will come to. Why why were they doing that? They didn't have didn't trust stand. in God, basically. He said he would wipe them out for them, and they wanted to take a look into it. Yes. And he said, I will give you the land. You don't have to earn it. You don't have to go and fight for it. Well, what did they do? No, excuse me, God, we know better than you, okay? I'm a major in the army. I know more about this stuff than you do. Okay, whatever. However they however they were looking at it, they had to go in and they said, it's fine. There are 23. The idea seemed good to me. Now, Moses Moses has got, we, we talk about the patience of Job. We could talk about the patience of Moses, too, because he had to deal with these people. And it was only just getting started, really, because we know there was 40 more years of, of leading them around after all this happens. The idea seemed good to me. So I selected 12 of you, one man from each tribe. They left and went up to into the hill country and came to the valley of Eshkol and explored it. Taking with them some of the fruit of the land, they brought it down to us and reported. And this is what they reported. It's a good land that the Lord our God is giving us. Well, now they, they recognize giving them. And they got the fruits of it. They're showing this is what it looks like. 
So the report was good. <clears throat> they came back to Moses and Aaron and the whole Israelite community at Kadesh in the desert of Paran. Mm -hmm. There they reported to them and to the whole assembly and showed them the fruit. Look at this. <coughs> Isn't this wonderful? Maybe, maybe the the oranges were the size of a basketball or whatever. <laughs> Look at this, how wonderful this is. And they were they uh, gave Moses this account. We went into the land to which you sent us, and it does flow with milk and honey. Here is its fruit. Then we get to verse 28, and that little three-letter word, but. But the people who live there are powerful, and the cities are fortified and very large. We saw, even saw descendants of Anak there. Anak apparently was the father of tall sons. The Amalekites live in the the Grail and the Hittites, Jebusites, and Amorites live in the hill country, and the Canaanites live near the sea and along the Jordan. They got all the names right. What did God say he was going to do? He's going to wipe them out. But, oh, no, 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 no. They live there. They live there. They're scary. Then Caleb, silence. He was one of the 12. There were 12. That we'll focus on the 10 here in a minute. Well, we're focusing on them right now because Caleb was not speaking. Then Caleb silenced the people before Moses and said, we should go up and take possession of the land for we can certainly do it. Now, what was he saying? Was he saying we've got so many good fighting soldiers that we can take it? All we needed was one, right? God's on our side. I think it was Paul who said, if God be with us, he would be against us. Well, there you are. If they want to be against God, that's fine. But he had the faith. But the men who had gone up with him said, now here we go. Here are, there, there are a lot of people who have, or not a lot of people, there are people, we all know who they are. We've known them. They could take the most positive situation and turn it into a negative. In a, uh-oh, you guys are looking at each other. Don't do that. Don't do that. Very distracting. That's perfect. But they can take the most positive thing you have ever seen, and it will be turned into a negative. Oh, this is really wonderful. Yeah, well, wait a minute. Wait a minute. Not really that wonderful. All right, so we can't attack those people. They are stronger than we are. And they are spread among the Israelites, and they spread among the Israelites a bad report about the land they had explored. This is similar to what um, Demetrius did last, well, in the story last week. It did last week, starting to create dissension, dissension and rebellion. And that's what it leads to. And that's what Demetrius did. Here's little Demetrius, a little silversmith. He's able to motivate the entire city of Ephesus into a riot. Well, these guys, these 10 guys, are doing the same. And I think we, when we studied the, the story, I think the estimates were between one and a half and two million Israelites were uh, crossed over the Red Sea and into, into uh the wilderness and would have been there at about this time. But he is able, they are able to motivate these people. And they spread among the Israelites a bad report about the land they had explored. They said, the land we explored devours those living in it. All the people we saw were of great size. We saw the Nif uh, Nephilim there, the descendants of Anak. We seemed like grasshoppers in our own eyes. <clears throat> And we look the same to them. That's an interesting uh, metaphor there to refer to yourself as a grasshopper. But I think we can understand what that means. I mean, a grasshopper is very easy. To, it's hard to wipe them out, but to kill them individually is very easy. 
I mean, they're very small. They, they don't have particularly uh, any kind of horns or teeth or whatever. They can devour uh, a field, but they are, we're just nothing. We're just nothing. <clears throat> and what did God say? Said, I'll be with you. That makes all the difference in the world. I don't care if you are grasshoppers. It's going to make the difference. No, 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 no. They are not in a can-do mode. They are in a can't-do-it. And remember again, God is going to give them the land. This is not a matter of how hard do we have to fight for it. He's going to give it to them. Let's go to numbers now, huh? I said we'll get to... <clears throat> Through the work, this is our walk through the Bible. Numbers 14, 1 through 24. That night, this is the same night as all of this report comes down. I remember Caleb gave a report. We can do it. That night, all the members of the community raised their voices and wept aloud. Boy, that's something they didn't do very often. <laughs> All, here we go again. All the Israelites grumbled. Oh, that's the first time that's ever happened against Moses and Aaron. And the whole assembly said to them, if only we had died in Egypt or in the wilderness. Why is the Lord bringing us to this land? Only to let us fall by the sword. They got nothing out of the mess. Nothing out of the message except negative and grumbling. Our wives and children will be taking us plunder. Wouldn't it be better for us to go back to Egypt? Here we go again. We want to go back to Egypt. And they said to each other, we should choose a leader and go back to Egypt. And what have they done there? In that one little sentence, they are now choosing a new leader. God had chosen Moses. They're not satisfied. And they are going to change that leader. Number two, we are going to go back to Egypt. Now, parenthetically, and it's not in Scripture, but what do you think Pharaoh would have done if these people had come back to Egypt? <laughs> I'm sure he would have gone out and greeted them with open arms, right? <laughs> oh, I'm glad you're back home. You're like family. Yeah, I don't think he would have taken them back. But anyway, that was never necessary. Then Moses and Aaron, they fell face down in front of the whole assembly, gathered there. And I have to tell you a little story real quick. Yesterday I was at a restaurant or at uh, Market Street having breakfast. And these two guys, there's a lot of Bible classes that go on there. I don't know what separation of church and Market Street. I don't know if that applies. But anyway, <coughs> they were saying, and, and, and notice in the scripture, and it wasn't this scripture. Notice in the scripture, fell down. On his nose on the ground. It doesn't say face. I'm thinking, well, you know, the face ain't very far behind the nose. <laughs> Last time I checked. But anyway, that's just a little aside. Okay, we won't do that again. Joshua now. Remember Joshua, <coughs> son of Nun, and Caleb, son of Jephaniah, or Jephunai, who uh, were among those who had explored the land tore their clothes. What's what's tearing clothes? What's that? Frustration. Frustration. Yeah. <clears throat> Disgust. Disappointment. Right? They were hoping they could get a new set. No. And said to the entire Israelite assembly, the land we passed through and explored is exceedingly good. Not just good. Exceedingly good. If the Lord is pleased with us, there's a big if. Because right now, what do you think he is thinking, God is thinking, he's not asking for this. He will lead us into the land, a land flowing with milk and honey, and he will, here we go again, give it to us. Only do not rebel against the Lord by rebelling against Moses and getting a new leader and by leaving, um, therefore, to, Back to Egypt, leading them back to Egypt, that's exactly what they were going to do. And do not be afraid of the people of the land, and parenthetically have faith in God. He's with us. And if you keep this up, you won't be, right? 
because we will devour them. And devouring, they're not engaging in cannibalism, they are engaging in, they will defeat them. Their protection is gone, but the Lord is with us. Do not be afraid of them. But the whole assembly talked together, talked about stoning them. So what do grumblers do when they don't get their way? And somebody comes up with a good idea and some, this is what we should be doing. This is what we should be thinking about instead of what you're thinking about. Let's get rid of them. What's that? Cancel. Yeah, we got cancel culture. First, there you go. Underline that. This is the cancel culture. Okay, that's but that's true. You <coughs> They don't exist. The more things change, the more they stay the same. <laughs> that is so true. That is so true. The Lord said to Moses, "How? How? Uh, wait a minute." Then the glory of the Lord appeared at the tent of the meeting to all Israelites. All right, I've had it. I'm here. That's what he's saying. The Lord said to Moses, how long will these people treat me with contempt? That's exactly what they're doing. <clears throat> how long will they refuse to believe in me in spite of all the signs I have performed among them? The ten plagues. Those just didn't happen. Those were miraculous. <clears throat> and then the pillar of cloud by day and the pillar of cloud by night. The angel leading them. What else does he have to do? And that's kind of kind of a uh, preview of what's going to happen with Jesus. How many miracles does he have to do to convince you, convince the people that he is the Messiah? <laughs> and they rejected him. <clears throat> I will strike them down with a plague and destroy them, but I will make you I was talking to Moses into a great nation greater and stronger than they. He had done that one time before. Mm -hmm. He wanted to make Moses. Yes, sir. One of the things I noticed here is that in verse 10 it says, Then the glory of the Lord appeared at the tent of meeting to all the Israelites. Yes. And I just wonder if uh, this whole conversation that God had with Moses, well, most of the time, you know, the Israelites after the, the Mount Sinai, they said, you go talk to God. We'll just we'll just stay here and then we'll listen to what you have to say. <laughs> I'm just wondering if this conversation that God had with Moses was in the hearing of the Israelites. I mean, the, the context almost kind of sounds like it was. Yeah, it does. It does. It does. It does. I think they had the microphone. It was an open mic. Yeah. <laughs> it may have been an open mic conversation. I think you. I think that that's a great um, observation because yeah, they did not want to deal with God directly. But they certainly didn't mind at all by treat, treating him with contempt. <clears throat> Moses said to the Lord, this is in verse 13. Then the Egypt, now this is interesting. As we go through this, think about this. When we studied this in uh, the story, the question was, is Moses disagreeing or arguing with God at this point? So let's go through it. Moses said to the Lord, then the Egyptians will hear about it. By your power, you brought these people up from among them, and they will tell the inhabitants of this land about it. They have already heard that you, Lord, are with these people, and that you, uh, and that you, Lord, have been seen face to face. That your cloud stays over them, and that you go before them in a pillar of cloud by day and a pillar of fire by night. If you put all these people to death, leaving none alive. The nations who have heard this report about you will say the Lord was not able to bring these people into the land he promised them on oath. So he swatted them in the wilderness. What do we make of that? Is he arguing with them or is he pleading with them or what is he doing? <clears throat> He's pleading with them to spare the people. Yes. And <clears throat> once again, we see Moses who has put up with these people, some of us might be tempted to say, God, do whatever you want. Get rid of them. That's more, let fewer headaches than I had. But no, he, he is making a plea. Please don't do that. 
and he's using some things. And <clears throat> he's not, ple he's not uh, appealing to God's vanity. Look, God, you're going to have a bad rep if you do this among the rest of the nations. That doesn't matter. But he is making a, a, a good argument there. And then he goes on, and this is very positive, starting at verse 17. Now may the Lord's strength be displayed, just as you have declared. The Lord is slow to anger. Boy, is he ever. This is a classic example of slow to anger. Abounding in love. And forgiving sin and rebellion. Yet he does not leave guilt, the guilty, unpunished. That is important. He punishes the children for the sin of the parents of the third and fourth generation. In accordance with your great love, forgive the sin of these people, just as you have pardoned them from the time they left Egypt until now. And he's had plenty of time to do that. Right? Rebellion, rebellion. <coughs> the Lord said, I have forgiven them as you asked. Nevertheless, as sure as I live and as surely as the glory of the Lord fills the earth, the whole earth, not one of those who saw my glory and signs I performed in Egypt and in the wilderness, but who disobeyed me and tested me ten times, not one of them will ever see the land I promised on oath to their ancestors. No one who has treated me with contempt will ever see it. But because my servant Caleb has a different spirit and follows me wholeheartedly, I will bring him into the land he went to and his descendants will inherit. So, he says, okay, there are consequences for bad conduct. There are consequences for disbelief. There are consequences for holding me in contempt. Now, very quickly, we'll go through this. What happens as we as we get uh, through this is, uh, if we look there at the numbers 25 to 45, we won't be able to read each verse, but as we see this, uh, look at uh, verse 34. This is what God says, basically said, uh, how long will this wicked community grumble against me? I've heard their complaints of these grumbling Israelites. So tell them that... Um, in the, this wilderness, your bodies will fall. You're going to die in the wilderness. Every one of you, 20 years or more, who was counted in the census who grumbled against me, not one of you will enter the land, I swore, with uplifted hand to make your home, except Caleb and Joshua. As for your children that you said would be taken plunder, I will give them or bring them into the joy of the land you have rejected. <clears throat> but as for you, your bodies will fall in the wilderness. For 40 years, we drop down to 34 then. One year for each of the 40 days you explored the land, you will suffer for your sins and know what it is like to have sinned against me. I, the Lord, have spoken, and I will surely do these things to the whole wicked community which has banded together against me. They will meet their end in the wilderness. Here they will die. They were so close, but now so far. So Moses sent the men to explore the land who had turned and made the whole community grumble against him by spreading a bad report. These men who were responsible for spreading that bad report, not only did they come back and say, Moses, this is not a good idea. They went out and spread it among the Israelites. They wanted to make sure that everybody understood we're right and he's wrong. These men who were responsible uh, for spreading the bad report about the land, were struck down and died of the plague. They died immediately. They didn't get to go out into the wilderness and wander and die there. But the ten who explored the land, only Joshua and Caleb survived. When Moses reported this to the Israelites, they mourned bitterly. Early the next morning, they set out to the highest point in the hill country, now we are ready to go up into the land the Lord has promised. No more grumbling, but they still don't get the message. Surely we have sinned. But Moses said, you disobeyed the Lord's command. You are going to wander in the desert or in the wilderness. And nobody 20 years or older, save and except Joshua 
and Caleb will ever enter the promise. What do we take away from this? Don't rebel. <laughs> don't rebel. <laughs> don't grumble or complain. Don't grumble or complain. So we want to do that. <laughs> God in his promises. Trust God in his promises. <laughs> I heard something. No. <laughs> it was a mutter. <laughs> You're not muttering and grumbling, are you? No, I said don't act like a teenager. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, don't act like a teenager. Yep, yep. Trust and the Lord your thing. God. I mean, trust in the Lord your God. And when he says it, he means it. Yeah. He didn't just say, hey, listen, I'm going to give you this land, maybe. I might give you this land. He had done so much for them. They had seen so many miracles that he had done. But yet they still complain. Absolutely. Absolutely. Anything else? Any other comments? Thank you for your comments. Oh, and thank you out in Zoom land. <laughs> Happy to see that you're here. In spirit and in not in person. Anything else? Well, that concludes the book. Next week we begin a study. We begin the same study, but Dewey will be providing us with the outline. So, um, and that will be. What is it that we look at next week? I love it when I write these things down and can't find them. Oh, here we go. Lesson nine, Michael. Judgmental. Second Samuel chapter six. She despised David and criticized him to his face as he was dancing, as she said, half naked in front of the slave girls. So we will study that uh, next week. And in Second Samuel chapter six, basically is where we will be working. Anything else? The good of the order. Thank you very much. The session is concluded. So far, you have not rebelled. The way you may have thought about it. All right, thanks. Have a great week. For those of you who are going to service, enjoy the service.